welcome to The Skating Lesson. I'm Dave Lees, and today I'm thrilled to welcome three-time European medalist, the 2012 Ross Delacom champion, 2010 Trophy Eric Bompard champion, and two-time Olympian Kira Corby. Kira, welcome to The Skating Lesson. Thank you, Dave. So nice to be here for the yes. first time. Yes, and I've always <laughs> enjoyed your skating. You're somewhere over the rainbow, yes. Um, yeah. But... You've been doing some tweeting lately, or uh, Instagram posts, and I saw that you are studying psychology now at the new school, and I thought it would be fascinating to pick your brain because it seems like you have a passion about proper athlete development, um, mm -hmm. and I was just so interesting about you know what you're up to and kind of talk me through you know the things that you're thinking about and studying right now. Sure, yeah. So I stopped competing in 2015, mm -hmm. and then I wrote a book uh, last year, or no, yeah, it was published last year. I mean, I didn't write it myself, but okay. <laughs> together with the sports journalist, and uh, and I was really um, open about my, my life and my struggles in skating and my highs and lows, and mm -hmm. that kind of started the conversation in Finland around the training culture in figure skating and how some of the aspects that are kind of normalized in the skating are maybe not so functional or should not be normal. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, yeah, three and a half years ago, I moved to uh, New York. Okay. And uh, one year ago, I started studying, or last fall, I started studying uh, at the new school and uh, psychology just seemed like a very interesting interesting topic but I'm I'm studying uh, a lot of other other yeah. things too and um, but yeah basically now I've I've found myself I, I never thought that I would find myself in this position when I stopped competing but now I have found myself that I'm I'm working as a as a children's and athletes activist, uh, mm -hmm. and especially now in Finland, uh, we are going through a big, big change in the coaching culture and in the training culture of figure skating and in other sports too. So I've been really active in that public discussion and talking with the government and the federation, the knowledge committee and different experts and scientists. And, um, and then I, I would like to do my own research also in in psychology so so yeah this mm -hmm. is where i'm at and uh i'm 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 glad mm -hmm. if my voice can can be of service to skating community in in an unexpected way for yeah. myself actually yeah <laughs> well i thought one day i want to ask you about is because i read you know your bio and was looking doing some mm -hmm. research and i never realized when you were competing that your father is a coach of female hockey players and he coached them to an Olympic bronze medal. So I imagine that you have another perspective on coaching, not only in your career, but I'm sure this is something that you're well versed in. He, you know, uh, led them to an Olympic bronze medal. So I'm sure that strenuous mm -hmm. training is something that you're very familiar with in the Corpy family. Yes, for sure. And he, he coached mainly in the eighties. Like his high time was in the eighties where he he was really the one pushing the the very extreme practices in coaching that maybe nowadays wouldn't be so <laughs> so like okay, um, but it's been interesting to talk with him and and he's very open about and he's very supportive of my work even though he's he's the old school coach that never really saw the um, the athlete as a human being uh, in a holistic way that I think nowadays coaches mm -hmm. are seeing. Mm -hmm. And um, and yeah, I mean, times change, the society changes, the world is in a big change. So obviously sports need, uh, need to change too. Yeah. So how early, I guess, would you say you got involved in skating at a young age? Um, yes. I read that you got your triples when you were about 11 or 12. You landed a triple sow cow. Yes. Which is impressive. And at the same time, in Russia, you would have been tossed aside <laughs> long ago, Kira. Okay. When did you, how young were you when you got the double axle? Did you have it by nine? Uh, no, I think 10 or 11. <laughs> old news. <I'm> like... <laughs> so at what point did you feel the culture starting to 
I guess, get intense? And would you say that, you know, maybe it was positive and then took a negative approach? You know, what was your kind of your experience with that? Um, you mean, if I look at skating in a whole? If you look at whole, your, own, yeah. your own skating, you know, yeah. Um, well, for me, skating was just a fun hobby, basically, mm -hmm. until I was 12, 13. Mm -hmm. And then I had another coach come in, and then the practice became really disciplined mm -hmm. and uh, systematic, and had a degree, really a university degree in coaching. And at that time in the university, they taught this kind of I don't know what word should I use, but like fear-based methods, like yeah. the, the, like the more harsh, the better. And especially for female coaches, it was at that time, um, like you have to be even like overly tough to prove that you can be a coach. So, so then when she came in, um, my career started to really um, take over and I've been I've been really like wondering now that um, that I might not have never become that mm -hmm. great skater if she didn't come with her like uh, like harsh uh, mm -hmm. coaching methods. But then I've also been thinking that that I I'm not sure if my skating career would have lasted even that long if I didn't have that long period until 12, 13 when skating was fun and I could enjoy and I did a lot of different sports and. Uh, so I, I don't know. And I think nowadays um, a great coach can combine uh, being uh, disciplined and demanding and very systematic and analytic, but at the same time not going to the, um, not motivating the athletes uh, mm -hmm. through fear, mm -hmm. but, but through their own, like somehow channeling their own, um, or make the athletes like really positive want own. to do it yes yeah. yes yes mm -hmm. and also see the bigger picture that mm -hmm. the athlete has especially in a sport like figure skating mm -hmm. the athlete's career is this short uh, yeah. compared to the, how long lives lives we usually have and then then if our identity is only hooked on the on the skating results it's it's mm -hmm. very hard to recover after I don't know an injury or your, when your career stops or something, and uh, I mean that's another topic that it would be so interesting yeah. to talk about. How do athletes transition yeah. after they get injured or after they stop? So I, I'm curious because I think a lot of people hear this conversation about coaching methods and they get maybe they get confused because I think obviously disciplined hard coaching is necessary for the yes. top sport you have to work hard you have to do the numbers when you're talking about neg some of the negative things that come into that like where does it cross over like how ideally if you had an ideal athlete that you were coaching <laughs> i don't know you're coaching <laughs> ashley wagner making a comeback right okay yes <laughs> okay what kind of training do you think that you would think is positive for her to do and where would it get negative Right? Like if you needed to be on top of her training, how would you design it? Well, Dave, that's that's the question that I mm -hmm. think we all should ask ourselves. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think I have mm -hmm. the perfect answer to this, but mm -hmm. that. But I think it's really, really crucial that we even uh, become aware of these mm -hmm. questions and want to kind of ponder that where is the limit and um, and what you said about the numbers that there there needs to be a certain number uh, I agree that some kind of number but um, but now when I look at uh, skating in America I feel like it's so much it's too much about mm -hmm. the numbers mm -hmm. like the the quantity really goes uh, like ahead of the quality most mm -hmm. of the time and the, the kids are so tired at the end of the day but they are still counting the hours and mm -hmm. and it's not just the coach that counts the hours it's the parents who are pushing too and the, and the money and, I mean, and the money and the and the kids themselves i mean i as a skater too i was also comparing mm -hmm. how many hours do i get in or i was kind of comparing how like I was shocked to find out that in Finland we we take such a long summer vacations, okay. and then when I came to America, I was like, oh my god, I'm being a bad athlete because these skaters here are like taking almost zero 
vacation. Okay. So how uh, much time would you take off in Finland in the summer? Uh, like a month. A month. And would you feel a refreshed month. when you came back? Would your body be healed? Or was it, did you feel rusty? Like what, both? Well, or... of course, in the beginning, a little rusty. But I think it's it saved me really from uh, many injuries. Like I started to have injuries only when I was about 18, 19. Okay. And I mean, after that, I had a lot of injuries. But before <laughs> that, I was very, very okay. healthy. And when did you get all of your triples? You know, knowing that you took those months off, uh, you took a month off in the summer. Uh, you know, did you get your triples in a timely way? I guess, like, what was your progression like? Um, well, I, and I didn't take the month in a row. Like, I yeah. had week here and two weeks here and one week here. Um, but yeah, I think it came pretty, um, pretty easily back. Uh, and uh, and then I, what I also think is uh, or was nice that uh, because my coaches in Finland took a really long break too, like two months, oh. almost a summer break, because they are not uh, paid by the hour. They are um, they are paid by the um, the club, oh. so they have a monthly salary. Okay. Um, and then they have a summer vacation. So I always and the other Finnish skaters we used to go abroad to. To camps to to learn from the Russian coaches, to learn from the American coaches, to learn from the Canadians. So, so that was I think also a re- very nice thing that I didn't only stick with the one. A nice uh, mental break for everyone too yeah, from yeah, that intensity. Yes. yes so yes. you said that your coach made you like a great skater, and that she also would use negative, you know. So I guess, what would you say that she was good at? And what would you say was negative about your coach? Uh, well, I had many different coaches and, okay. uh, and many different um, experiences, mm-hmm. some very positive, obviously, and then mm-hmm. some not so positive. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think the emotional abuse is quite common in in figure skating and i didn't even realize that it could be called abuse because Mm -hmm. it's so normal that the coach can yell at you and the coach can stop just coaching you if you Mm -hmm. you fail to um satisfy his or her Mm -hmm. standards or needs or or the coach can comment on your body and your weight and your everything that has to do with your personal life and and then also the physical um, a physical thing that sometimes I think the coaches might overtrain you, and I, I feel like that's especially some like an issue here in the states that they put the kids through almost too much, and then they get injured. So there is a very um, fine line in that in that too, and I think we need more research uh, to show that. I mean, I know I even heard the ISU medical expert to say that after the judging system changed, uh, the numbers of injuries in figure skating has increased Mm -hmm. dramatically. Uh, I would think now that they have a points value on a triple triple or a quad, everyone knows that regardless, it doesn't matter. Like if you land that quad, you are getting, say you get 10 points, right? 11 points. uh, the parents, I think, push harder to get it because now it's tangible, right? Now it's... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And in a way, I think it has made our uh, sport more objective. Mm-hmm. But then it has, like, uh, it has developed in such a short time in such a, such a massive steps that I don't think we are really mm-hmm. following up. Uh, and uh, now we are kind of, I think we are like, whoa, like... Mm-hmm. 11 year year olds are doing quads that yeah. we're like is this like is it is safe this, i guess is safe yeah. yeah is this safe even for the body and then to think about what goes on like in the emotional side and psychological side and i think the main problem in skating is that a lot of the times the coach or i mean sorry mm-hmm. the athlete is viewed uh and coached as a product mm-hmm it's a product of the system and a product of the coach and kind of a, um, um, extension of the ambition of the coach or the the parent or whoever. So it's it's very hard for the young skaters to feel 
um, like especially after their career that um, I mean maybe for for the those skaters who have then achieved medals they at least have like something to grasp but then then there are those thousands and thousands of skaters who train as much as dedicatedly and as passionately and then they end up injured because they have been overtrained and they can't they can't skate anymore possibly they can't even do any sports after they are i don't know 13 and they their hip has been replaced and their knee has been uh, under surgery so so yeah i don't remember where i was going uh, with this but there <laughs> well one question i have is you trained with Raphael, right and i mm-hmm. know that he is a big proponent of the group coaching method where all of the skaters are on the ice together and it's a motivational tactic where if the skater is doing well maybe more attention gets paid to one skater Mm -hmm. and it forces the other to work harder but is there a negative element to that as well because if someone is not doing well Mm -hmm. are they then ignored and is that yeah i think it has a negative effect especially in the long run for the Mm -hmm. for the self-esteem of the of the athletes and especially Mm -hmm. For the people as human human mm-hmm. beings, um, yeah. uh, it places so much. Like it's basically that the coach says that you're worthy worthy only if you can do this and this and this. And and obviously the young skaters learn to at least I learn to kind of value myself according to to how I did in the practice, how I did in the in the competition, and and the coach. This is another tricky thing in in figure skating and sports like gymnastics, that the coach, um, the athletes are so young and it's uh, you start training like crazy so mm-hmm. young, and the coach is almost like a god mm-hmm. to you because it's uh, the athlete views the coach as a as a god figure mm-hmm. and and at least for me I don't know, for other athletes I think it's the same that uh, the coach becomes a bigger authority than even your own parents Mm -hmm. because figure skating is the first love and it's the biggest love and it's your dream and you would do anything to achieve Mm -hmm. achieve your dreams so the the coach um, that's why also has a really big um, power Mm -hmm. and that's why when the coach has some so much power uh, the ethical concerns should be even more uh, elevated. And I think here is a thing that sports in general are lacking so much behind. For example, school, school system, the, the teachers are, I mean, they need to <laughs> have certain kind of a, a way how they behave with the students. And, and if they don't, they will be taken out and yeah. replaced. But but it's hard with the um, with sports, and at least now in Finland, I've been working a lot with the with the systems, and it seems that there are not even not even enough maybe um, legal um, like uh, legal possibilities and even like ways to to handle these things. So, mm-hmm. and then there is the question of the safe sport organizations and if the if the federations and Olympic committees and all these organizations, if they are really taking seriously all these, um, like, um, reports and, and things. So when you were an athlete in Finland, were you mm-hmm. aware, I think that's one of the questions people have, of the kind of abuse that was going on, whether it be emotional, sexual, it's mental, it's yeah. Sexual. yeah. Did you, is those things that you would see on a regular basis or know about? Like, how common was it? Yeah, I mean, um, it was quite common, but I didn't realize it back then because, mm. like I said, it just becomes normalized in mm. the culture. I was, I remember I was um, looking at, a, I think I was about 10 years old and there was a coach in the other club uh, in our city and I was looking at the older male coach mm. being with the small girls and like, I don't know it just seemed off and then he went with to the dressing room with them with the girls and then he went with the with the r is it rv the big car the he car, traveled yeah. mm-hmm. with 
the girls in the car to the competitions and and things like that that mm -hmm. just like seemed so often how sh how he yelled at the uh, skaters and then but then you just I mean then you know it's crazy how how you just um, get used to it even mm -hmm. though it's it's weird and here i mean in america too it's it's shocking how normal it is that the the coaches can have sexual relationships with the underage girls and it's just like oh like a normal thing yeah, <laughs> yeah. and everyone knows it but no one talks about yes. it yeah yes and then yes. I, I and then that the everybody sorry yeah no <laughs> but the, and then that everybody is like shout all the there can be like 30 kids on the ice and then 30 coaches on the ice and maybe half of them are are screaming or yelling or shouting and half of this the skaters are crying and it's like a normal day at, at some rinks. i mean obviously i'm generalizing and there are a lot of great great rinks and great coaches and a lot of good work but but i mean we need to talk about this yeah, and I would think even the partners, you know, especially with pairs, you have obviously younger girls skating with yes. older boys, which is very common. Yes, and, that's a thing that we don't have in Finland that much mm -hmm. pair skating, but here it's a big, mm -hmm. big thing. Yeah. Well, I was reading one of the article where it said that um, abuse athletes that are coached by abusive coaches are more likely to cheat in sports. Is one of the studies that has been found, mm -hmm. and I was oh. wondering. I think I've seen the documentary Icarus and I've heard, you know, skaters talk about things over the time and not getting into specifics at all, but is performance enhancing drugs or rumors, are these things you were aware of while you were competing? You know, is that something that was even kind of talked about? When I was competing, no, mm -hmm. I mean, at least not mm -hmm. in my country. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, in other sports, I knew. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had a big scandal in uh, in skiing, mm -hmm. cross country skiing. Uh, but in skating, I never. I don't think I ever heard until uh, I came here and I I started to hear some things and and uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess is that something you're aware yeah. of in skating now? I think that you know, obviously, they're with the last Olympics with. Um, Russia, they weren't going to be able to compete, and they did compete, and then there's been so much talk about meldonium and things that, you know, have really changed, you know, over yeah. time. Um, and yeah, that, that is a really uh, concerning aspect, definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, I, yeah, I know some of my ice hockey friends who've, who've been um, um, playing in, uh, in Russia, Mm -hmm. And they say that it's a, it's a little bit scary when they are just given given some vitamin pills for breakfast and nobody explains what it is and but I mean I don't I obviously yeah. I don't know and I haven't seen but yeah. I after seeing mm -hmm. and hearing mm -hmm. anything is possible. Mm -hmm. Now, how about when you competed internationally? Um, you're obviously you're training with a lot of other coaches. Uh, on these practice sessions that you're not training with at home, do you see a lot of behaviors that are abusive or strange? Is that something you're aware of, you know, while you're practicing for an event? Um, well, usually when I was competing, I was just so mm -hmm. like this concentrating. So I wasn't really um, paying that much, much attention, but, um, but in some summer camps, I, I, became familiar with some of the uh um some of the methods uh mm -hmm. and uh, how it's kind of normal to ridicule or humiliate the student in front of everyone and uh, um and uh and then the i mean the yelling and the screaming and the name calling it's totally fine and uh, and then as a skater you kind of grow up to um to think that oh I deserve this and this is this is what just like this is maybe even good I mean that's the mm -hmm. maybe the sickest thing that mm -hmm. many skaters and many parents and many coaches think that this is the best and the right way to go and there is no other way 
But if you look at other sports, I was just the other day, I was uh, watching an interview with uh, Phil Jackson, mm -hmm. the most decorated uh, NBA coach. And, and his philosophy in coaching was something that I was like, wow, like, can he please come and lecture to this game? <laughs> because his principles uh, I mean he's uh, he's um, he's been studying Zen Buddhism and that's why he's called the Zen master uh, but for example when he coached Dennis Rodman who was a very difficult uh, a difficult player he said that the only way he could uh, handle him was to um, was not to get uh, get into his emotional drama like he's he stayed centered. He had been practicing mindfulness and meditation, and then he let Dennis to do his own thing. And then when that was done, he 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 went back and coached him. And then um, and this kind of uh, philosophy of um, kind of giving up the control. I think that was one of his main things in coaching. That I, as a coach, I have to give up control. Which for figure skating coach, uh, coaches sounds like, oh my God, like, what's going to happen? Nobody's going to learn anything. Everything's going to go. But even, I think, children, if they are th taught in the early stages to, to really um, become mindful of their own um, feelings and emotions and how their body feels and, and this and how, what are their um, goals and visions and I think they grow up to have a very strong self uh, sense of like uh, agency and self-efficacy and they become like really strong not only strong athletes but strong human beings and um, so so I don't know what was the question yeah. anymore but, <laughs> no, but that's it. I've read I've read 11 yeah, Rings yeah. by yeah. Phil Jackson and I, I agree and I was yeah. thinking when you were talking about um, Michelle Kwan and the success that she had and I know that one of the things is that she was very disciplined with knowing that she needed to do her run throughs and her section work and yeah. not needing someone maybe to scream at her to do it like that was something that she worked on herself and I don't think that she was someone that was I don't think Frank did a ton of screaming you know at her yeah. so I think yeah. with you like what did you need in order to be I guess, prepared for a competition? Like, what did you, I guess, what would a healthy training yeah. plan look like for you? Yeah, and, the, and the, that is true uh, that um, people get, like, fired up from uh, from different things and yeah. and some people maybe need more screaming. And, I mean, mm -hmm. I it's just, it's not even the volume of the coach's voice that is mm -hmm. the uh, determining thing. I think it's more the than the and the energy that's, kind of beneath the mm -hmm. the scream I mean you can be loud and screaming and like pushing but still mm -hmm. still um give the vibe that that I'm I'm here mm -hmm. whatever happens I respect mm -hmm. you I uh, like just mm -hmm. gives a safe um safe uh, feeling for the athlete um yeah but for me before competition um I I don't know I I wish I could go back mm -hmm. now in mm -hmm. my skating career and uh, maybe um, maybe ha have have the coaching in a little different way done. Mm -hmm. Would your coach I, do negative things, I guess, to get you to perform, you know, if you were struggling? Like what would, I guess, what would a negative tactic be that, you know, was used on you that you look back on? Um, well... It's hard to um, pinpoint like just one one thing. It wasn't it wasn't like threatening before competition. Like I'm gonna punish you if you don't mm -hmm. do well. But it was just the kind of accumulating stress uh, in in all of us in, in in my coaches and me. And then um, then I felt like uh, every time I I failed or I did a mistake. Uh, it was always, um, it was never like a discussion that what could we do as a, as a coaching or training team better. It was always like, how can we fix your uh, like head or your, 
therapy or something. So I think uh, that's the kind of thing that starts to wear you down a little bit when when you always uh, when you're always trying to find the the fault in yourself. And obviously, I mean, of course, it's the skater has has some fault too. And I mean, the skater is the one that skates. But I think uh, a great coach has also the the capability to self-reflect and to be really attuned with uh, his or her own emotions and inner world and not to take that uh, out on the skater or or kind of things like that so so you had more of your success kind of between like 2011 to 2014 you really hit a yeah. real stride now how old were you at that point you know, you weren't like a 13 year old Russian who was, yeah. No. Yeah. yeah, I think I was, twi- I mean, I'm 88 born, so I was like 22. Okay. No, no, more, 24. Okay. Or, well, well over 20, so old okay. grandma. <laughs> <laughs> so when you watch the skaters that are, you know, on the Grand Prix, everyone has been winning who is, you know, 15 years old they're all doing quads and a lot of them don't make it until 17 years old they're done i guess what when you watch that you you know what are your kind of thoughts because obviously the tricks are impressive they haven't really learned maybe the same skating skills or the artistry and and that expression and it seems almost robotic in a way i guess you know what what do you feel when you watch i guess the skaters who are winning right now um, well, you kind of describe the feelings uh, yeah. that uh, they are very mixed uh, in mm-hmm. a way. I'm very impressed by their their skills and it's just like mm-hmm. amazing, like watching uh, the most amazing circus tricks. And mm-hmm. it's just like, wow, like, because mm-hmm. I mean, I've been doing triples and I couldn't even imagine mm-hmm. like doing quads and, mm-hmm. and these young girls are doing them like like this so obviously i'm very uh impressed Mm -hmm. um but at the same time uh it's obvious that you feel the the mechanistic way and i think it comes from the training because Mm -hmm. probably since they were three years old or i don't know Mm -hmm. very young they are in the system and it's a system that just produces human beings into athletes in a very effective way. Mm-hmm. I can't say that it isn't effective. The other thing is that is it ethical and is it is it healthy in a long term? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's similar to, I think, in U.S. gymnastics. You know, we learn so much, unfortunately, after Larry Nassar about what the real um, effects were on the gymnasts yeah. who went through it. I think, you know, the winning was obviously the, amazing, you know, the records and, and the performances yeah. like that. But then you see, um, you know, there was that quote in an article that you sent about how, you know, there are maybe 300 broken yeah. um, broken girls for every one athlete. And I think it's yeah. quite true if you look at even the coaches, you know, in the Russian group of everyone that is winning, how many from year to year yes. who don't make it, who aren't in the group, the training group and how. Yes. Yeah. And we don't hear about their, their stories. No. We hear about struggle. No, after they, they are not, um, they are not worthy for the system anymore. So who cares? And I mean, maybe it's even dangerous for them to start mm-hmm. talking about their yeah. experiences. So I think that's why I feel, um, it's not easy or it's not pleasant to talk about these things in my, in our beloved sport, but Mm -hmm. I, I come from a country and now I live in a country where Mm -hmm. we are free to talk about this. So, Mm -hmm. so that's why I feel obligated. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's my right and also my responsibility to talk about this. And how about, I mean, this is a whole other topic, but, the effect of social media on people who are young, obviously skaters get a degree of notoriety um, more Mm -hmm. than, you know, their average peers at that age. And they start to get a lot of attention on social media. 
positive and negative and mm-hmm. their behavior obviously morphs from that. And I think we see some athletes on the tail end of their careers who I think struggle with the depression and the anxiety that comes mm-hmm. with training at that high level. And then I think, you know, there are certain cases in the last years where we see athletes who are really struggling. Um, And then they are acting out in ways where you think that, you know, hopefully in a healthy society, someone would, you know, take charge of that. And it doesn't seem like people Mm. are. Is that something that you notice? Is it? uh, Yeah, I mean, uh, I have noticed. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a very difficult question, because if these these skaters are already uh, adults, Mm. (laughs) so they are they are in charge of their own life but lives but um but yeah I, I think the social media in general is such a new new thing added mm-hmm. on top of the the pressure of of the sports and the training that we would need a lot of more education uh, and i don't know if there is in the for the u.s skaters for example is there some education how to I think there's some, and it's also learned. I, I don't know if you notice, but now every time when a skater competes at an event, there's usually like a reaction post to it that goes up, whether it is positive uh-huh. or negative. Yeah. Um, it's just a different culture, yeah. a different world, yeah. I think. that yeah. yeah, and it is. And in a way, it's great because the fans get closer mm-hmm. to the skaters and they see the other, maybe, mm-hmm. if the, I mean, if the skater wants to reveal their personal life or something, it's it's wonderful in that way. But um, but yeah, then it can maybe reinforce some um, or maybe model some unhealthy uh, behavior to some younger skaters or something. I don't know. Yeah. And you talked about the transition. So when you left skating, you obviously were still young. Um, do, how quickly do you feel like you advanced? Because obviously you talked about doing well when you were 24. But did you feel like the average 24-year-old then, in some ways, you're very mature and advanced, and in other ways, you've been very sheltered. So I guess, what was that transition period like for you? <sighs> yeah, it was almost exactly that, like that. But mm-hmm. I've lived this incredible life with so many so intense wild experiences Mm -hmm. and two olympics and this and that and i lived in many different countries and and work with a lot of different people so and traveled a lot so in that Mm -hmm. sense i had lived a long life but then again i i didn't know anything about normal Mm -hmm. life because Mm -hmm. it's it's so closed um so yeah it uh, is really i mean my last competition was such a disaster that uh (laughs) I didn't even know it would be would be my last uh, last competition, but uh, but that kind of broke the the identity of me only as a skater, and I was so um, empty and depressed and everything that I I just had to like dive de- deep into myself and uh, and find out what I really want, and then it was crazy because my mind was like so programmed into the training and always achieving more and more and more uh that my mind was so of course i'm going to continue skating but then my my body just one day was like oh like it was like i can't stand up and go practice anymore it just Mm -hmm. wouldn't work so so that was the decision but then it took me a few years to figure out what i and it's hard to know mm-hmm. am I good at anything else I mean I've been in school 100 years ago but I don't know if I'm mm-hmm. I'm still good at that um, but then uh, life took me to New York and um, and then I I found this school and I it was really healthy to to get the perspective outside of the skating bubble and I think that's why I have so much to give because I have already like lived in the normal life or in outside of skating so i can now uh really clearly see some of the the things that i thought uh, even as a skater that are completely normal that now i think should not uh be tolerated so easily 
I think one of the things of abuse you're talking about education is that so many skaters, at least in the U.S., become homeschooled. And either, it seems like it goes one of two ways. Either they become very self-sufficient, they become very disciplined about their schooling, about their skating and their studies, or it seems like schooling is just an afterthought. And to me, that's another almost form of abuse to rob a child of an education and you don't realize it at the time that this is happening. But... Is that something yeah. that you saw a lot? Does that happen in Finland as much or what? Oh, Finland, there is no concept of homeschooling. Okay. At all. At all. Like, I don't know anyone who, okay. would, who would do that. So, so did you um, miss school for skating then? I guess, how did you? Uh, yeah, I miss like the university. <laughs> okay. But did you but go the... for a full day of school? Like, did you? Yes. Normal, normal school. Not full day. I maybe had the morning, some mornings off so I could train like twice a day which now is crazy i was training like two hours on the ice okay. per day and here the kids are training i don't know four okay so oh. you had to do a full course oh, yeah it's, yeah that's yeah. so foreign here because some of yes. the athletes are going five six sessions a day in, in some yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah okay yeah and um yeah, I think that really helped me to also stay he uh, healthy for so long and injury free. Um, and it was also very good for my social life and for my um, some kind of mental health, at least at some point at that point that I, I could really uh, uh, like have my school friends and I was in an athletic school. So there were other athletes and I could talk to them and like we had this nice uh, group going so I I really um, share your concern mm -hmm. with with the fact that so many of our kids here in the U S are are taken out of school. Yeah, I think it makes them also more vulnerable to the kind of abuse that you were talking yeah. about too. If you yeah. don't have yeah, and and a lot of the skaters here they even move to another city and they might not even have their parents there mm -hmm. and it's. It's many different things, yeah. Yeah. So you talked about when you left skating. So you obviously you were injured. Mm. When you decided not to go to the rink, I guess, was it like a full-blown relief or was it like a depression first before the relief? Like what kind of – or um, was it a relief and then a depression? Like kind of – it was a depression for like before the decision. For oh, before sure. the decision. Like, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, because a lot I of mean, times, a lot of times I feel um, watching, you know, towards the end of an athlete's yeah. career, almost as a viewer, sometimes we could see with certain skaters that we know that they should quit before they should. Mm -hmm. Like it seems like the joy is gone and the it becomes a little hard to watch. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, my last years too became almost like an obsession to, I was injured and I think now looking back, it was kind of like my body saying to me that like, this is enough, like, why don't you just stop? But, but it's very hard to stop because you are so in it and you have the feeling that, ah, maybe there's still something more that I could reach and I haven't been able to like I haven't shown my full potential yet and all these things. Um, but yeah, then, uh, yeah, I, I mean, my, my, the last competition was, was just such a. What happened at the last competition that was so bad? Like, does it, uh, <laughs> it was, I didn't even qualify Jay, for the long program at Worlds. Okay. It was that bad. <laughs> <laughs> and did you know going in that it would be bad? Like, did you have a feeling or were you shocked? Oh, I mean, I had um, Achilles tendon surgery like seven months before. Okay. Uh, but I was still so, like, obsessed with but my But Achilles goal. tendon surgery, you're out for like six months before you should be really doing much, right? Like, you're off the ice three, four months completely, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So okay. it was kind of stupid, too, <laughs> okay. that I tried to come back, so so soon but i was mm -hmm. uh yeah i mean i wasn't ready physically and mentally i was so worn worn out i had a, a very dysfunctional uh coaching relationship at that time and i was training alone uh not in finland and uh, i didn't have any social life so i was like crying almost every day at the ring but i was like oh no i like finally 
I can go to the Worlds because I'm not injured, so I will go. And uh, and then at the at the short program, I just couldn't do anything. Okay. Like I I fell my first jump. I popped the two other jumps. So it was like a complete meltdown, and I it was almost in the verge of being like a spiritual experience too because I probably the trauma or the the shame of doing such a bad per- performance uh, triggered the such an intense dissociation that I I remember like watching myself skating my uh, step sequence at the end of my program and I remember watching myself skating from the above okay which was wild I was like I Obviously, so you feel I'm so crazy. dissociated from yourself. I, yeah, yes. Yeah. So I okay. wasn't even really in my body. Okay. I mean, obviously I was skating, but I, yeah. I felt, I remember feeling like, how can I be skating? And then how can I be like somewhere up watching myself skating? Mm-hmm. So it was very bizarre feeling. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then that, after that, it was this the next months that came after that were like a complete uh, roller coaster and and uh, and the dissociation had been and I think a lot of athletes suffer from dissociation a lot because we have to I mean the pain that we have to endure and the sometimes the very brutal abuse you just kind of have to dissociate from the pain and from from your emotions and to be able to like survive and to mm-hmm. be like the uh, the machine mm-hmm. producing the the training and the programs, so so yeah, it was uh, mm-hmm. and um, it's still sometimes <laughs> it's uh, difficult to. Are you uh, haunted by the last performance or bothered by it, or or do you have enough space now that you could look at your career as a whole? And be like, that was a bad moment. Or, yeah, yeah. So now I can already uh, watch the performance. And uh, um, I mean, it, it's not uh, a happy thing to watch, but yeah. uh, but I can talk about it. But for yeah. it was a, uh, for a long time, it was a very hard mm-hmm. thing to... Because, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think of athletes sometimes as... Um, um, it's kind of warriors that go to war Mm -hmm. and we, our war is not a actual war where we can be physically killed. uh, Mm -hmm. But our emotional self Mm -hmm. can be uh, very much um, um, like hurt or even kind of killed at some, some Mm -hmm. situations like I think happened to me that the, the, the shock and the, the trauma of doing such a bad performance was like the skater self w- died in a, in a way. And I just had to kind of dissociate completely. Um, so yeah, <laughs> but it's been, it's been a long journey to, um, that's one thing that if, if I ever were to become a coach or if I were ever to, uh, start some education, uh, programs for coaches I would uh, the first thing that I would teach is about emotional intelligence and to like how to feel your emotions and how to how to use them and how to um, uh, really like take advantage and not mm-hmm. not judge because I think a lot of the times emotions are seen as bad in mm-hmm. a kind of side Actually, the negative ones are like uh, uh, that bad that we should be just like these cold stoic machines and then suddenly we I mean the expectation is that then when the performance is on we should be very emotional but then other than that we just we should never complain never just like go 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 so it's um, it's I think a very important thing to learn to feel Mm-hmm. and appreciate all the emotions. Now, I want to ask about skating in general when you watch now, because I would characterize you as a very well-rounded skater. You were good at spinning, you had your jumps, you were a very good skater in terms of skating skills. So I think one of the criticisms now is that 
there are no skating skills that kind of go on or the performance is different. So mm. I guess what attracts you when you, like impresses you when you watch skating now? Mm. Well, I want to say that I think the young skaters, uh, even the, the youngest stars, I think they have very good skating skills in a way, but it's very mechanistic and technical. Mm. And I mean, it's normal if they are 14, 15, they don't even have the life experience to, um, to, to really feel and to kind of transmit the emotions to the audience. And I think mm -hmm. that's why we love skating mm -hmm. historically, because it's mm -hmm. been not just a sport, but it's just been this way of, uh, for people to live with the skater in her emotions. Mm -hmm. And now uh, what I fear is that the training and the demands and the jumps and everything of the sport is so high that there is no room for the mm -hmm. emotion for mm -hmm. being like uh, uh, emotional. And, uh, and that's why I think some of the performances feel uh, cold mm -hmm. in the level of the heart. Uh, mm -hmm. Although when I look at or like think them <laughs> just <laughs> like in my brain, I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, but then, uh, yeah, I think that's what, what mm -hmm. I would like to see more in skating mm -hmm. is kind of take back the the heart level mm -hmm. and the, the personality. And we mm -hmm. want to see these athletes. I mean, they are amazing as mm -hmm. athletes, but we want to to be able to see their personality and mm -hmm. and how they grow up to be human beings and how mm -hmm. they make mistakes in life and then how <laughs> they do great things and all that like yeah. just like life yeah. in skating. And within skating and now it's just like oh, I don't know <laughs> it's funny how now we get the personality in like the choreographic sequence which lasts like 25 seconds um, but I, I you know I think one of the things if they if they did that with the spins like they've done it in the dance a bit where they have the elements that are uh, prescribed that everyone has to do all the difficult step sequences but then yeah. they offer more creativity in some of them and I think it's allowed some more personality yeah. back in yeah. yeah a little bit yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but um yeah but now i think as especially for the ladies skating the big question is even that with these technical demands is it even possible to like should we even like is it even uh, unrealistic to expect that there could be some older uh, skaters or even a skater like me I don't, I'm almost 170 centimeters I don't know what's uh, the, the height of Carolina Costner so okay amazingly tall yeah and I, I don't think we would be able to see you wouldn't uh, be doing the quads in the same no, way yeah I don't I don't think so but I mean so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think the other thing is that we like to watch people. You said how we like to watch their ups and downs as athletes. Yeah. And that's one of the attractive things with skating. But I think be, to be competitive and to be able to do those quads, I think as soon as some of these skaters go through puberty, unfortunately, the technique that they've trained their whole life doesn't last. The technique that allowed them to do those quads. I was watching a girl do two quads who's 11, which is mind blowing on one hand. And then to realize she may never make it even close to the Olympics because she could be done in three years. You know, that's... Yeah. 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 yeah it I feels don't know. like there's I mean, a reckoning maybe coming. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's just, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm hopeful. And I, yeah. I see that at least now in Scandinavia, this topic is discussed a lot. Mm -hmm. Also this week at the time when... Finland, uh, these news are coming up and skaters themselves, even active skaters, maybe mostly the retired skaters, but even some at, uh, active skaters in Sweden mm -hmm. are like saying like, okay, like this, like the physical abuse is not mm -hmm. this century anymore, yeah. even in figure skating. So we <laughs> want something else. And, mm -hmm. and this is the trend that I'm hopeful that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that we're going to see that young people like we're seeing in so many other areas in society that it's the young people that are saying like we need to take care of the environment mm -hmm. or 
like I don't know, young people are getting more active. Like Greta, who talked about yeah, the Greta, yeah. Yes. yeah, and even I mean, in other political things too. So I'm I'm hopeful that the the young young people and then the retired athletes and I mean, uh, <laughs> skating experts and coaches and a lot of uh, experts and different people from different fields are coming together and kind of um, figuring out together and asking questions together and giving other like different opinions and I mean yeah I'm 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 at the same time as I'm scared where this sport is going I'm hopeful that we're at least we're now able to talk about yeah. this and like well, I feel like you're going to be very in, in demand about this topic because you have spoken mm -hmm. up. Um, you know, how much schooling do you have left, I guess? How many years or, you know, and what are your ultimate goals for that? Um, well, I have my bachelor's degree done in spring, next spring already. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, so, yeah, I was able to transfer some of my credits from, from Finland. So this has been fast. Uh, and then I'm planning to do a master's degree in psychology here at the new school. And I would like to um, to be involved in the researching um, these things related in, uh, to figure skating specifically, because there, there are not much uh, research done specifically in figure skating. So I don't know if I can somehow help to... Uh, uh, mm -hmm. to narrow that gap and uh, and then my um, longer term goal is to um, I also have a certificate in positive psychology mm -hmm. so I would like to maybe um, de develop a co um, education program for coaches mm -hmm. that is based on positive psychology and how to coach uh Psycholo psychologically skillfully mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing uh, but then I don't know maybe this activism work mm -hmm. uh, will kind of pick up too and I I get to talk to people and uh, and hopefully <laughs> step by step <laughs> make some difference <laughs> yeah. well where can people find you you know to keep on track of what you're doing and what you're thinking about you know um, you know do you, Twitter Instagram what are your handles um, yeah, I have them all. Okay. I mean, the, the three main, I have Twitter, Instagram, and uh, Facebook. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sharing um, a lot of, a lot about these things, especially in, in Twitter and Facebook. And I mean, in Instagram too, but in Instagram, maybe some of my personal life too. So if, if mm -hmm. somebody wants to follow that and yeah, I'm, I'm excited to wear this, this, second life will take me but I'm so um, so happy that uh, skating I mean it's still the first love and a, a big love in my life and I'm so happy that I can I can give back in this way and I'm grateful that uh, that you have allowed me to talk about these things and that we're so so passionate about skating and uh, and bringing the personality and the best back. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This has been so interesting to chat with you today. It's such a pleasure. Um.